Hey everyone, welcome to another Speed Secrets podcast. Today I'm talking with Dr. Jerry Lynch. And I have to say, Jerry, it's a real honor for me to be speaking with you today because, uh, well, you've had just a big influence on my life. So thank you for being on the podcast. I, I, uh, I want to tell everyone that's listening here that it's equally an honor for me because of you and, and, and all the good work you're doing. And to invite me on to this show uh, is a way of not only uh, <laughs> not only uh, making my work a lot happier and a lot more fun. And uh, so I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here, actually. Well, th- and uh, some quick background first and for listeners, I guess, is – you know, back in the early 90s, I was you know, working at uh, dr- trying to make a career as a professional race driver, driving Indy cars. I was driving an underfunded Indy car, and I was looking for every every avenue that I can to help me perform better. And I really got into the mental game. And I don't, I, I don't even know how, but I stumbled onto your, your book, the book that you and uh, you're going to have to help me pronounce your co-author's name. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Okay. I'm uh, going to make you suffer. Okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> Jung El Hung uh, Wang. There we go. Jung uh, Yes. Uh, Jung El Wang. There we go. Uh, Thinking Body, Dancing Mind was the book. And I've read that book at least half a dozen, no, probably closer to a dozen times from cover to cover. But I keep going back to it, and I just pick it up every now and then, and just you know, I'll look quickly, look at one chapter. It's really been sort of my go-to for perspective on so many things, and I can honestly say it's I, like I said, that book, your book, has had the biggest impact on my life. So, first of all, just thank you for writing that book. It was amazing. Well, uh, it was a pleasure to write it, and. <laughs> When I hear you say things like that, it makes me want to write another book. Good. Well, I understand you are actually writing another book, aren't you? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, it's written, and uh, it's my 14th book. Wow. I, I thought I'd get up to that number, but uh, it's my 14th book. It's called The Competitive Buddha, and it will be out next spring, actually. Ah. We have a book for it already. That is cool. The Competitive Buddha. That's a great uh, title. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of people don't know that uh, they they listen to that and they say, the Buddha, wait a minute, he doesn't compete. But he was the first, actually the first student athlete ever, and he competed at a high level. And uh, what he taught me is that when you're competing, you learn a lot about yourself and and, and the lessons of life. And that's what I write about. And so he, uh, in this book, I describe how he was a competitive athlete, the the athletics that he competed in, and what he did learn about himself. And I encourage everybody out there, if you're driving around a track and you're going at fast speeds, what are you learning about yourself and what are you learning about life and what is this great sport of car racing giving to you? And yeah. and so I think that's part of the reason why I'm here, I believe. Well, I've always said that you know, I've learned so much about racing, but it's what I've learned from racing that matters the most. And wow. uh, that's that's the, the key there. But uh, hey, c- can you give listeners, I guess, a bit of your background uh, in sport and, 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 and especially what you're doing these days, I guess, too, but uh, just the, sort of the quick background on, on your involvement in sport and what you do? Yeah, well, you know, Ross, thanks for asking that. Because, I mean, look, I'm a, I'm a gym rat. <laughs> yeah you know at the eight you talking to me before this uh we began this uh podcast and and you were saying that you got into your sport at the age of five well at the age of five i remember clearly uh going to the gym all the time my brother was older than i and i would follow him around and i just loved the smell of the gym and the locker room and everything else and i've always loved sports but I wasn't just a jock as such. Uh, I, I loved athletics, but I also loved philosophy and I love writing. And, and I was an English lit major in college and all of that kind of thing. And and so what I what, what I did was I, I, I started to uh, when I started to compete in sports in high school and college and beyond, uh, I realized that uh, there, there are many different ways of competing and uh you know, I found out the message really early that uh, it was the mind and actually uh, our heart, our passion and, and our courage and our commitment, our deep commitment to what we're doing, not only in sport, but in all of life. 
And so I, I kind of got that message very fortunately at an early age, and it stuck with me. And uh, I competed. Uh, uh, my sport is uh, uh, distance running. So uh, I ran anything from 5,000 meters on the track to a full-blown-out marathon. And uh, I competed uh, sponsored by Nike up until the age of 42. Uh, and I'm a late bloomer. So you can imagine, uh, that's yeah. when I started having a family at 42. I, I started everything late in life, you know, and so, uh, but anyway, so, so that's a basic background and I, I still compete and I don't compete, but I still run, uh, mm-hmm. and I still bike on a daily basis and that's how I like to start my day and then get into my work. Uh, I wish that, uh, so, so I've, I've run one marathon in my life and want to keep going back and doing it again, but my body just isn't, isn't cooperating. <laughs> uh, yeah. it, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a little beat up, I think, but, uh, I'm curious, uh, wh- why do you suppose that for some athletes, the philosophy, the mental part of it, you know, th- there are some athletes that are just all about I don't know, brute force, uh, uh, you know, I'm just going to make things happen. And there are other drivers that sort of come at it from a, and you have a degree in sports psychology, but you've also kind of merged this whole Eastern philosophy approach to, to your approach, I guess. And uh, what, what triggers, what, what did, what triggered it for you? And what do you suppose it triggers it for some athletes and not others? Well, you know, it, I think when I started out in this, in this business of uh human performance let's call it that yep uh it it wasn't like the most popular thing in the world uh i had to sell it i had to sell myself i had to sell the uh the content but that was 35 years ago uh i would say today uh the mental game is uh is rampant it's all over the place uh i i don't have to sell myself one bit people are uh, knocking down doors to get to what I'm doing. Uh, and it's not just me, it's other great spirits out there and other great, uh, uh, sports psychology people, uh, who are getting a lot of business and a lot of work, uh, you know, and, and, and I really do believe that we're now at a place in our lives where people understand that 90% of the game is mental, Yeah. whatever game you're in. I mean, uh, you know, driving driving these amazing cars at amazing speeds uh, around an oval, uh, you've got you've got to be mentally tough. You you you've got you've got to have the mindset uh, that's not going to lose focus at a crucial time. You have to have you have to have the calm within the storm. You have to have that still point inside when everything around you is going crazy, when people are cutting you off or, pe- or you're racing around the track and, and, and you're negotiating this turn, this upcoming turn. turn. You, you really have to have this sense of calm inside you. And, and so today, in all these sports organizations at the professional level, I have a consultancy with professional NBA teams, uh, soccer, professional soccer teams, college teams, uh, individual sports, uh, you know, surfing, climbing, things like this. All of these people are very aware that today the athlete needs to be mindful. They don't say they need to be talented physically. They need, they say that they need to be talented mentally. Hmm. And, and, and this concept of mindfulness is a way of, of actually it's, it's a way that I teach in, in this new book, The Competitive Buddha, actually in the book that you're referring to, too, uh, Thinking Body, Dancing Mind. As you know, Russ, I mean, it, it's all about being mindful. And, and today the word mindfulness is a household word. Yeah. And, and it is right. And, and and years ago. Mindful what? You right. Know, People would be like, "What are you crazy? What? What?" So, so today, uh, we're really, um, we're really have broken through to a to another level. Uh, bless, bless his heart. Uh, the passing of Kobe Bryant hmm. uh, this past year, uh, as sad as that was, 
he, he mentored and taught us a lot. Uh, up until the day he died, uh, Kobe Bryant practiced mindfulness uh, in his life uh, as an athlete, as a, as a, as a person. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the coach of the Chicago Bulls and the Lakers, uh, Phil Jackson, yeah. uh, set up his teams uh, with a room that was just for mindfulness training. And he would invite someone like a, a, um, a George Mumford, who, mm-hmm. by the way, wrote a, wrote a wonderful book called The uh, Mindful Athlete. Yeah, I've read that one. Yes, I love it. <laughs> Yeah, and, and George is a good friend of mine, and we have these conversations all the time. But uh, George would go into the locker rooms of of these amazing athletes, Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen and uh, Shaq and Kobe, and 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 he would train these athletes uh, in in mindfulness training. So uh, I don't know if I'm answering your question or just sort of elaborating upon a thought that that, that you align with, Ross, which is. The importance of the mind and the developing of the mind and and, and the developing of a mind is a skill that you train, just like the skill when you get behind the wheel in a car. Uh, You know, you train physical skills, you do repetitions, you do all these kinds of, you know, you go to the gym, you get strong, you you train your muscle. Well, the mind is a muscle and uh, and we have to train that, too. So uh, there are. Definitely techniques uh, w- which help with mindfulness and allow you to uh, train that wonderful muscle that you have there and not to lay it, let it lie dormant. Well, it's interesting that you bring up Phil Jackson because to me as a, uh, as a coach, I mean, I, 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 I look up to Jackson as a, as a model of a great coach who, uh, in just his whole approach to, to coaching, I think... Uh, well, I think it changed some of the acceptance of the mental game, did it not? Like he was sort of, it seemed like he was one of the first coaches in, uh, you know, big name sports that kind of accepted the fact that, hey, the mind is pretty darn important here. Yeah, uh, he he definitely did. And, and you're right with that, Ross. And uh, he, uh, he got a lot of... Uh, a lot of attention with that because he had won and, and our society is really bent on winning. Yeah. Uh, and you know, I love to win. You love to win. But, uh, what, what Jackson was talking about in his work with his athletes was, yeah, we, we love winning. Uh, but, uh, there's no path to winning. Winning is the path. And uh, what he meant by that is, uh, every day in every way, how you train when you get up in the morning, how can you uh, win the day, uh, which happens to be the title of my latest book, Win the Day. Yeah. But how do you win the day uh, by doing all the things that champions do and put that together when you're on the court and not think about the scoreboard, but think about the moment, controlling all the little things mentally and, 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 and being relaxed and calm because you can you have confidence in things you can control. You can't control the outcome of a game, but you control how you play the game. And, and so, yeah, he was, uh, in fact, he was another one of those coaches that really uh, took advantage of, of uh, some of the things I was writing. In fact, Thinking Body, Dancing Mind was the book that allowed me and, and Phil to get to meet each other. And uh, he used that with his players, would hand it out, actually handed a copy of that book to Michael Jordan, uh, as I understand it. And Michael actually read it, I heard, and which is amazing <laughs> for me. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, yeah, so Phil was one of those coaches who, who talked that way. And uh, we have a lot of coaches today, uh, such as Steve Kerr, yeah. another good friend of mine from the uh, Golden State Warriors. He understands that the concept of the uh, – of the mental and uh, in the heart and competing with heart and uh, Greg Popovich uh, with the San Antonio Spurs. And uh, you can see I have a lot, a lot of connection with basketball folks, but yet I can lay, I can list 25 coaches in uh, sports like uh, surfing and climbing and other things that, and they believe the same thing. And, and so yeah, it's, it's, it's wonderful for, to have your listeners understand that the, this is something that, that if they're not already doing that, that, you know, they need to consider putting that into their uh, wheelhouse and become a little more 
uh, adept at, at, at using the mind to, to not win on the scoreboard as much as to be a better version of yourself. And, and Ross, uh, you know, to me, uh, my life journey is I wake up in the morning as, OK, how can I be a better version of myself today? What can I do that will make this a good day? And one of the things on the list for today was I get to read. I get to meet Ross. Ross Bentley and 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 I get to talk with him and 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 his listenership and and uh, it gives me a chance to uh, to use my mind and heart in a way that uh, makes a difference in this world and and that's why we do what we do. Mm. Uh, it, and you, when you were listing off coaches, uh, so I, I'm uh, I live in the Seattle area, so. Obviously, Pete Carroll is another one of those guys who. Absolutely. Uh, oh, absolutely, Pete Carroll for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, and I'd say that motorsport as a as a whole, uh, I'd say it's one of the sports that uh, was kind of one of the the holdouts in terms of even accepting coaching. You know, when I started coaching drivers, probably when I really really went and I started really focusing on being a great coach, that was going to say the mid nineties. And uh, when I said, why coach drivers, people looked at me like, what? You don't coach race drivers. They just get in the car, stand on the gas pedal and go fast. And, and yet, you know, every sport in the world have had coaches at that point. So I'd say motorsport was one of the last to accept that. And maybe even one of the last to accept the kind of stuff that we're talking about today. So I, I guess I want to ask the question of what do you do when you have an athlete that looks at this stuff, what what you're doing and says, whoa, that's just a little bit too woo-woo for me. Yeah, well, you know, I don't get many of those athletes. Um, well, so so they don't even come to you because they're, they've got to be accepting yeah. beforehand. Yeah, okay. Well, I, I think I think if people come to me, they kind of know what I'm about already. They've been yeah. referred to me or they've read something that I've written or they've heard me speak at a convention or something. And or one of their buddies uh, is reading a book and they say, oh, you got to contact him. And so when someone comes to me, they, they have an openness about them already. I mean, there's a whole bunch of people out there that will never, ever know who I am or what I do. And 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 that's normal. And and but, you know. There's very little resistance once the people show up. On the other side of that coin is I don't go out there trying to push or or convince or sell what I'm doing. Uh, I, I love the expression, uh, the ancient Chinese uh, talk about uh, teachers, right? And, and, and the expression that I love to use is this. When the student is ready, the teacher appears. Yeah. You know, and, and and like you, you're there. You're, you're a coach. Um, and I know you love coaching. And uh, as a coach, you're there. But some some of the drivers are not going to come to you only because they're not ready and, and, and they don't get it. And that's OK. You know, there's a lot of things I'm not ready for right now in my life. And uh, maybe I'll never be ready. But when the time comes and I'm ready, I'm going to go seek out the minds and, and and the experts and the people who have the wisdom to guide me through that part of my journey. And, and so it's really nice that uh, when I started out, if I could rewind the clock, I uh, I did have to do a, a, a sell on this. And there were very few people who understood it. And those people did reach out to me. But there's a whole lot of other people. I would I would talk in front of an audience and they would, you know, like, what the heck is he talking about? And part of it was my inability to explain what I was teaching, perhaps. Yeah. But a big part of it, I believe, Ross, was uh, they they were resist. They were fearful. And, and people say, well, what are they afraid of? Well, they're afraid of success, maybe. You know, they hear that I have some ways and some techniques or there are some ways and strategies and techniques and tools that if we use them, we can actually be successful. Well, there's there's a concept that I want to throw out there that a lot of people listening, maybe it's for the first time, which is there is a fear of success. Yeah. Right. For sure. 
Right. And the fear of success is this. Picture this, right? If I'm successful and I become number one in the world in my sport, let's say I'm the number one surfer in the, in the world. Everyone's going to be coming after me. Every time I go into a, uh, a surf competition, I'm going to have this pressure. I'm number one in the world. I have to win. I have to keep going to justify my existence, right? Mm -hmm. So it's very hard. It's very difficult for so many people, so many of us to, to think about the idea of being successful. And, and uh, once you become a success, there's a lot of pressure on you to maintain that success level. And anything short of success and being number one is a failure. Whereas if, if you're not quite there yet, you can always strive for it. No one knows about it and you can keep improving slowly. So, so all of that to say a lot of the techniques that I would talk about or introduce to people were, are sometimes met r with resistance because on a deep subliminal level, uh, they kind of feel like, you know what, geez, do I really? Okay, if I'm going to be successful, that's going to take time away from my family, away from my friends. If I'm successful, I'm going to have to keep working at it. And in order to get successful, I have to work a lot. So there's this idea of, oh, my gosh, can I handle all that's going to come my way if indeed I am the success that I believe I can become? And so why should I take what Jerry has to say and put that into my calendar to train with because at some point it's going to be difficult for me. Yeah, it's well, and I, I just finished writing an article about uh, Sebastian Vettel, four time world champion, Formula One driver, who I believe is, you know, is struggling right now. And it's, it's a lot of the stuff we're talking about, but um, uh can, can we, uh, one, one of the things that I love about Thinking Body, Dancing Mind, and, you know, for listeners, man, if you don't have that book, you need to go and get it because you're going to be so tired of me talking about it. But, uh, you know, one of the things that's great about it is you, you basically have these very short little chapters about each little, uh, I guess, topic, uh, uh, I don't know, there's like 30 or 40 of them. And, and just so you know, Jared, just how, uh, of a geek that I am, uh, I found, I, I have, and I've had it in the, in the little table next to my bed ever since I first read your book. I'd gone through and highlighted the key points. And then I took those and I typed them up in a separate little document. And that document sits in my in bedside table. And oh so I could just pull. So I actually, you know, and, and to be honest, I hadn't looked at it for a little while. Uh, but one of the very first things that I actually highlighted and, and I keep in mind is, You'd said the mindset of an extraordinary athlete is relaxed but focused and open to ever higher achievement. And to me, that you know, the relaxed but focus is kind of the zone, the flow. But the ever higher achievement is that open mind to wanting to get better. And a lot of people ask me, you know, what makes world champions or Indy Five Hundred or NASCAR champions or whatever what makes them so good? And I often just say is they're hungry to learn more. They want to get better. And yeah, I, you know, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I, and, and I and, and I got to think. You know, you know, watching Michael Jordan years ago. I mean, he just wanted to be better. Right. Exactly. And and that is you're absolutely spot on there, uh, Ross. Uh, the champion. When I when I talk about. Okay, so I have a book. It's called Way of the Champion. Yeah. Uh, uh, another a nice follow-up to Thinking Body, Dancing Mind. But in that book, I make it really perfectly clear that being a champion is not having someone put a medal around your neck or hoisting a, 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 a winner's cup or getting the payoff with a, with a financial prize. Being a champion is a day-to-day -day process. As I said, there's, there's no path to success. Success is the path. So the question for everyone out there, including myself, is what do I need? How do I need to be? And what do I need to do in order to make today a champion day, in order to win the day, in other words, in order to be the best version of myself I can today? And that's all I have. I can't talk about tomorrow. I don't know what's going to happen. So today, you know, I have a list of things that I need to address. I'm doing them one of them right now, which is having this 
uh, inspirational for me uh, conversation with you, Ross. And then I have a series of meetings and I have another podcast and I have this and I have, you know, so these champions, what I call champions uh, in the way of the champion, it's a mindset. And it's a mindset which says, I want to learn. I want to get better. Uh, I want to find out how I can be the best version of myself. And and that might start even at the breakfast table. OK, so we go down and we have breakfast and, you know, I make a choice today. I'm going to have oatmeal and fruit and and it's going to give me some energy and it's good organic food. And uh, as you can see from where I'm going with this, uh, there are many facets to being a champion. Right. You're right. So we have diet. We have uh, the, the mental game that we have to practice. And uh, so there's so many aspects to being a champion. But the, but for fundamentally. The nice thing about my definition of being a champion is it's not an outcome. I can't control being I have been crowned the champion in my sport, but I can't control that. Uh, if someone else shows up that day and they're at a higher level than I am, I don't become crowned the champion. But the champion that I'm talking about is totally controllable and it's a choice. It's something we choose. You know, it's almost like. Okay, so I was talking to uh, Lakey Peterson. Have you heard of her at all? Uh, uh, she, she's I, a she's quite a character. She she's a young woman. She happens she, at one time she was rated number one in the world, best women surfer. That's right, and, I know the name. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and so we're having uh, my podcast uh, is the Way of Champions podcast. On Thursday, uh, we're going to be uh, having a conversation on the podcast. And before this happened, she said to me, Jerry, she said, I don't know. I don't know whether I'll win a contest or not, but I know I can be a champion throughout the whole contest. And and she said to me, my mission in these words, I'm not quoting her directly, but basically she was saying, my mission is I want to be the best freaking surfer that I can be. And if that means being the best in the world, that's what I want to be. And, 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 but notice the way she couched that. It was like, okay, so I said, how are you going to be the best you can be? She said, right now talking to you is one of the steps I need to take. Uh -huh. uh, you know, she, uh, she often refers to way of the champion book. And she, she's told me, uh, that that she takes takes this book all over the world with her and she pulls it out of her travel bag and she reads highlights like like you did with thinking body and and she said you know what she said that's just part of my everyday being a champion and and so what i noticed working with champions is it it's a day to day process it's how do we win the day how do we do the things today that will not bring a championship but will allow us to be Right now, in the moment, a champion, acting like a champion, doing all the little things uh, that keep us on that path of being the best version of ourselves. And I'm funny thing is one of the little notes I'd made myself is to ask you, what is your definition of champion? Because because of that. <laughs> and, and so you answered my question. Thank you. And uh, I, I the great thing about that the way you look at it uh, is it doesn't matter whether you are, you know, a world-class surfer, uh, a, you know, an NBA, uh, you know, starting forward uh, or a track day driver that goes out on weekends and, and just wants to have some fun or a club racer. You can be a champion of that day, right? You can be the champion of that day might be, you know, I was able to drive just as fast as I always did in the past, but I did it with less effort. Uh, yeah. and, and therefore, I'm now more consistent because I can do that re repeatedly. So that could be the champion of the day, looking at it from that perspective. Does that seem right? Absolutely. That's spot on. And, uh, you know, and the, the beauty of this, again, and I know I'm repeating myself, but it's worth repeating, is A, you can control whether you do that or not. 
No one's going to take that away from you. You show up at the track. No one can say, all right, we're not going to let you be a champion today. No, get out of here. Are you kidding? <laughs> I mean, come on. I, I'm already determining that. So it's, a, it's a, uh, a controllable. And number two is it's a choice that we make. And, and you make the choice. So you're accountable to yourself. This isn't a coach coming in telling you, OK, Ross, you got to do X, Y and Z. You know, you come out to the track and this is what you got to do. And I'm going to watch you do it. Uh, <clears throat> this is your choice. Your choice is to go to the coach uh, and, and, and get in, in, input from the coach. Your choice is to uh, to be the best version of yourself. And all of that is controllable. And that's the beauty of this. And it takes away so much pressure and so much anxiety and fear that we're not going to be able to make it, you know? And yeah. so what I'm helping people do is let's redefine making it. What does making it mean? Like right now for me, right? Making it is not, gosh, you know, I want to, I want my next book to be a bestseller. That's not making it to me. Making it is how can I be the best I can be sitting here with Ross, having this conversation so that I can make a difference in the lives of others and I can control that. I control that with my – I've been preparing for this for 40 years, right? I have 40 yeah. years of work behind me. Uh, so I have all of that experience. And plus I'm opening up my heart. I'm connecting with you. I'm making this uh, enjoyable uh, by, the, by my attitude and how I, how I focus in on what we're doing here together. And uh, it's complete joy and, and uh, it's work. It, you know, well, I'm putting effort into this and you are putting effort into it. And, and, and the listener deserves that from us. And yeah. otherwise, we're wasting their time. And, and so we make choices every day uh, how we want to live our life. And it sounds simple and it is, but it's not easy because some, some of us out there are thinking, yeah, but OK, there we go. That's the trap. The yes, but trap. Yeah. Now, yes, I know what you're saying is true, but and then you have a whole litany of excuses as to why you can't control your life, take charge, make choices that are healthy and 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 be the champion. Don't wait to become a champion. I love telling athletes you'll never become a champion. And they look at me like, what? Why am I coming to you? <laughs> and, and I say, well, think of the words. You'll never become a champion. You either are a champion or you're not. And I'm going to teach you to be a champion now. And when you be a champion, then you open up the possibility of becoming crowned a champion, which is nothing more than a group, a body of people recognizing that you are a champion. There are a lot of champions out there listening to us today, Ross, but yeah. people don't recognize it, you know, but you should recognize it yourself. You know, and you should be the judge of that. Uh, when I go to bed at night and put my head on the pillow, I think about my day, which I do every evening. And I think about what was today like? Was I a champion? You know, did I do a good job? Could I have done better? In what way? So I'm 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 self-assessing. I'm not picking up the, the phone and calling Ross and saying, Ross, so how did I do? You know? <laughs> right. Am I OK? You know, it, it, it's I know if I if I live the life of a champion and, and I think we all do, we just have to be mindful is that word again, be, be mindful of the things that we do do and take care of them and, and make choice, make the right choices. But doesn't that take confidence to be able to do that? Because, you know, if I'm not confident in my ability to assess myself, I'm gonna, you know, I look outside, I look to the, I look to others to give me that, uh, that feedback to tell me, well, you're a champion today. Uh, yeah, that's a great insight you just threw out there. And I'm going to say I can't answer that because it's so complex. Uh, yeah. Think about think about what you just said. Uh, uh, this goes back to childhood when you have parents who don't give you the power. They don't empower you to make your own decisions and think on your own. Just think about the schooling that you have. You went to schools and they didn't teach you how to think critically, right? Mm. You know, you go to school, even through college. I mean, I'm going to say even through my Ph.D., the professors there, they, they weren't interested in critical thinking and they weren't interested in helping me to self-assess how good I'm being. What they were interested in was 
feeding back to them every little word that they gave me on an exam. And right. if I did that, I was an excellent student. But to me, it was like, that's not an excellent student. So, so, so we have parents and we have teachers growing up that don't teach us the most important aspect of learning, which is to be a critical thinker, to be able to self-assess, to have the confidence, as you so astutely point out, Ross, to have the confidence to know that, you know what, I did a good job today. And I know I did a good job. And this is why. And we're always looking in our society. There's too much emphasis on external affirmation, on external uh, re- receiving feedback from others as to whether we're good enough or not, whether it's our appearance, our performance, uh, what we say, what we do. And, and, and I get that. But boy, uh, if, if someone look, we just have to start understanding at some point in our life, we know intuitively and trust that intuition that when we're doing something that's really good and we've really made a difference and we've done the right thing for ourselves in a day, identify that, go to sleep and feel good about it. <clears throat> So you talked about it being controllable and I, and, and I, I mean, to me, I look at it and go, the only thing that we can control is our own performance, right? And, and, you know, I know that, I know where that thinking came from. It started with your book and it, I, but I'll, I'll say the one chapter in your book that I struggled with the most at that time and probably still to this day struggle with a little bit is just the, the chapter on competition. And mm. I was the kid that, you know, if we were walking to the corner store, I needed to get there before you did. Uh, everything that I wanted to do, I wanted to do it better. Uh, and, and for, you know, I was a very, very shy kid and everything, and I wasn't a very outgoing kind of thing. So it wasn't like to kind of do that, but it was just, I just liked the idea of being there before you did. You got there, right? And <laughs> And I have coached drivers on kind of this, you know, the only thing you control is your performance. So focus on your performance and you'll get the result, the win that you're after. But if you focus on the win, you're probably not going to perform at the level that you want. And therefore, you're less likely to get that win. Of course. But of course. I've also yeah. worked with drivers who uh, the reason they're successful is that drive, that that I want to be the best. And, and you know, you 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 put a carrot in front of them and they'll chase that carrot. And, you know, when I was just recently watching a little bit of that Michael Jordan uh, documentary, like he just looked like a guy that was just driven by, I got to win. I got to get this. So uh, how, talk to us about competitiveness and competition and that part of it. It's, it's, it definitely is one of my favorite things to talk about because uh, I kind of relate to what you're saying. Uh, even now at my age, I'm in my seventies. Uh, I, uh, if I go out for a run and I'm going up a hill, if there's a bike ahead of me going up that hill on a mountain bike, I try to catch that bike. I want to be the first one at the top of the hill. Yeah. If someone's coming up behind me, um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to run a little harder. You know, I don't want them to pass me. So, and, so uh, Jerry, just to interrupt, sorry, I really apologize, but I'm walking through an airport and I don't want somebody to pass me. <laughs> I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Well, well, listen, listen to my take on this. Yeah. So it's not about beating the other person. How about if it's about letting allowing that person to push you to a place where you become better than you would have been if that person weren't there? Right. You see what I'm saying? Yes. Yes. You see, it, it, in Latin. Uh, OK, so I was a. Uh, uh, a student in high school, we had we had to take Latin. It was a Catholic high school in in New York City, right? So uh, so I always enjoy a good Latin word now and then. <laughs> uh, I wasn't a very good Latin student, but uh, the word the word for competition in Latin, the Latin root is compatiere. And and the reason I bring that up is because this is the real meaning of competition. So let's get this straight: competition. Compatiere means, translated means, to seek together our greatness. Hmm. 
So when you're going, when, when, when you're trying to uh, uh, be faster than somebody, without that person there, you'd have no one to measure it with. It, it's an attitude of, do you need to beat somebody to put them down? Or can you use somebody as a partner? And because that partner is there, it'll help bring out your best. My best races, my best performances in my sport always, always were because my competition, the people I was competing with, not against, were willing to join me on that journey. So that if you and I go out for a friendly run and we're going up a hill, I'm going to push the pace. And if you want to join me, fine. If not, what's going to happen is you'll go faster than you would have had I not pushed the pace. And if you go ahead of me and you get to the top first, that will force me, not force me, but that will nudge me to run faster than I would have run if you hadn't been there. And so competition for me is a dance. It's this beautiful dance between yourself and another or others if it's a team. And and rather than be your enemy or someone to annihilate or someone to beat up on, they become your partner knowing full well that if they bring their game today, whether it's on the racetrack or whether it's uh, – on the basketball court or in the swimming pool, if they bring their best game, I have a chance to really find out how good I can be. Because there's no way without that motivation, without someone else trying to nudge you along, push the pace, push the envelope, there's, there's, it's, it's awfully hard to, to, to find out how quickly you can go. I mean, I could, in my training runs, in a 10 mile training run, I could never go as fast as if you put me in a race against some of the most elite athletes in the country. Right. You know, that's what I'm saying. So when I would show up for a national championship race, I was, ex oh, I was so excited because I knew the best runners in the country were there. I also knew because they were there, I did my training that they're going to push me to my best performance ever. And that might be a victory on the scoreboard, or it might not be. But one thing is for certain, that I will be the best I can be that, that particular day. So competition becomes this wonderful dance between you and what has been called your competitor. But it really is a partner in both people, compatiere, trying to find out how good they can be, to seek together. And, you know... It really takes away a lot of anxiety and a lot of stress and a lot of tension. And guess what? When you have a, a handle on those items, you're more calm and you're more relaxed and you're more confident. You're going to run or you're going to compete or play or do whatever you do and you're going to be the best you can be. Uh, yes, absolutely. And it's interesting. I, I've worked with many drivers. Well, no, I'm going to say I've worked with uh, – a number of drivers who are consistent high performers. And mm -hmm. one of the things I hear them say a lot is bring me your best game. <laughs> like yeah. I want, I want the competition. That's right. Uh, I, 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 I want, I want others to push me. That's right. And, and, and Michael Jordan wanted the same thing. Kobe Bryant wanted the same thing. There's no question. The greats want that, you know? And, and in fact, they get very impatient with people who, who are not playing as well as they could play, and and they get they get upset by that, and uh, they'll let you know it too, and uh, you know Michael on on his team uh, on the Bulls would would often tell his teammates, you know what you're you, you're not doing it, uh, yeah. you got to bring it, and 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 when you bring it, I bring it, and and so I need for you to push, and and so we're all in this game, this bigger game of life, right? And one of the one of the goals in our lives can be it doesn't have to be to be I'll come back to this phrase again. On a journey. 
to be the best version of ourselves. In order for me to be the best version of myself, I need you, Ross. I, I, I actually need you. And I need you to challenge me. I need for you to bring the great questions that you're bringing to the table. And what that does is that forces me to go inside and to dig down deep and pull out ideas and thoughts and comments that I knew kind of existed, but maybe they haven't been alive maybe in several weeks, days, months, who knows. So we compete together. Uh, we work together to be the best version of ourselves. And, and I'm here to help you do that. And you're here to help me do that. As a result, the, our listenership, the people who listen to your podcast, they're getting the most out of this as well. And then they go on with their day. And look what we're doing. We're, 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 in, we're, we're inoculating uh, society. Uh, we're bathing uh, we're, we're bathing uh, society in, in, in this kind of thinking, uh, a way that's healthy, a way, a way that makes sense. And uh, there's no losing in this game. You see, uh, yeah. if, if, you, if you're addicted to the scoreboard, you can lose, literally. And there's nothing wrong with that. But there's no losing in the game I'm talking about or that you and I are talking about. Because as the, as the great uh, Chinese philosophy uh, says um, – in, in some of their great books, you know, there's a phrase uh, that I can quote, which is we lose, but in this way, win. So all of our losses and setbacks and and failures are our greatest teachers. I mean, seriously, like like I, I might have 14 books published, but I'm going to tell you something. I can't tell you how many of those books like your favorite book, Thinking Body, that was declined for publication like 13 times. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, no, seriously. That that book, I was, you know, I was told that that book won't fly, basically. And, 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 and but but this philosophy of we lose yet in this way win, when I get a rejection, that's kind of a loss for me. Then I go back to the drawing board and I have a choice and I can control this. And I can make that a better book or I can or I can quit. But I didn't. I made it a better book. And, and, and every time I got a rejection, they gave me comments to help me make it a better book. So all of my failures and all of my setbacks and rejections in life have taught me to be the best version of myself. When you lose on the track, on the racetrack, if you put together all the things that you need to look at, you become a better driver. You become a better athlete. So there's no loss here. The only loss that I can identify that's really a true loss is if you get knocked down, don't get back up. That's loss. Yeah. And, and it's a lost opportunity and it's a lost learning situation. And so every time my strength is not in my brilliance, which I don't consider myself brilliant. Uh, I'm not a scholar. Uh, I love what I do. But the truth of the matter is that my strength is really that I never give up and I always get up. Hmm. So I never give up and I always get up and, and, and go back again, learn from my mistakes and failures, put it together. And isn't that life? I mean, how did we learn to, to use a computer through a series of setbacks and failures and mistakes? And, 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 and so life is the same way. And if you take that philosophy and you superimpose it on today, you're a champion. Right. Because, because all champions think that way. So we come full circle here. Yeah, we have. And uh, just to kind of, and I should wrap this up, I guess, but uh, uh, one of the things you were talking about when you were talking about, you know, Michael Jordan pushing himself, I got to tell you, the very first year, uh, uh, the very first year, the Vancouver Grizzlies NBA team started because uh, I'm from Vancouver. I, I got uh, shared some season tickets. I went to a bunch of the Grizzly games, and uh, I remember going to the game when they were going to play the Chicago Bulls with Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen, and you know, like, and of course, you kind of go there first year, and we were just you know expecting the Grizzlies to get absolutely blown out, but it was like the perfect game for somebody from Vancouver, in that at three quarters, the Grizzlies were up by like eight points or something like this. 
and Jordan had scored maybe four points in the first three quarters. So it was kind of like, wow, is this exciting? We're beating the Bulls. We're beating Michael Jordan. How cool is this? And then you could see Jordan walk out in the last quarter, and it was like, nope, this isn't going to happen. Yeah, He went crazy. I mean, he scored like something like 35 points in the last quarter and just like put on the magic show. And... And it was, it was that, it was just, it was like, I think, it, I think he probably, maybe even Michael Jordan kind of went into it going, ah, oh, this is going to be easy. Yeah. But the Grizzlies all of a sudden pushed him just enough for him to go, nope, I got to up my game. And boy, did he up his game. It was, it was wonderful. So. And, and that, that plays right into the point I was making. Yeah. Ross, which is the Grizzlies pushed. Yeah. The, the end. And 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 maybe Michael did walk into the arena and the rest of the Bulls, and they said, "Oh, like all right, let's get this over with and get to bed tonight." You know, we've been on a road trip for a long time. Yeah. And they went out there, and at mm-hmm. one point, Michael woke up and said to himself, "I'm just guessing now. Oh my God, these people are contenders." Yeah. So what the Grizzlies represented were compatieri seeking together. Yeah. They pushed Michael to a place where Michael had to dig down deep inside and say, what am I made of here? And the Grizzlies are providing this opportunity for me to see if I have what it takes. And sure enough, he did. But the thing is, without the Grizzlies pushing, it would have been a lackluster performance. He probably would have wound up with eight points total on the game. Yeah. And 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 so that's what I'm talking about. It's an attitude. You don't want to go into an arena and feel you have to beat somebody to justify your existence or, or the fact that you are a champion. You don't have to win the game. You don't have to win the race in order to prove that um, you're better than somebody else. No, it, it's like, ah, here we go. I get a chance tonight to find out if all of this training I'm putting together is really helping me to become a better version of myself. And sure enough, hopefully the the opponent comes in and is a partnership with you, agrees and say, you know what? I hope you bring your game tonight because we're bringing it. And if you can't match it, it's going to be really a tough time for you. <laughs> and, and, and so that's an attitude. Yeah. And, and so even with, you know, I, in, in the past I've had, groups that I went out to ride with and uh, we go out for four or five hour rides on a bike <clears throat> and uh, on the way home, you know, it was like a race and uh, there's a city line in Santa Cruz and everyone knows it who's a cyclist. And when you're coming down the coast from half moon Bay, it's about a 50 mile ride from half moon Bay. Uh, everyone's like really pushing the pace and these are friends these are these are people we have dinners with uh we have fun with you know so these are buddies right right we're going down and i'll tell you every one of us we want to cross that that sign that says welcome to santa cruz we want to be the first one like we were in the tour de france (laughs) yeah and everyone is pushing everybody and it wasn't about me beating those guys or those guys beating me. It was like, you know what? Because they're here, man, I am going to have to really work. And when I do, I'm going to find out how good a shape I'm in. <laughs> and uh, so it was this wonderful partnership, which goes back to the whole philosophy, the Eastern thought of, you know what? Our losses are our greatest teachers. Our opponents are our best partners. And we're here to win the day, not win the game. And we win the day by being a champion, doing all the things we can control and making that choice. Well, I think that pretty much <laughs> sums, sums it up. Uh, Jerry, thanks so much for for being on the podcast. It's been, uh, like I said, it, it's an honor for me to be able to just spend this time talking with you and, and uh, uh, getting what has been you know part of my life for what's it 25 30 years or whatever it's been that's Uh, that's amazing to me you know you can imagine how i feel having written that book to hear someone say that uh it's what a pleasure what a pleasure for me and uh i'll tell you the best part of this 
broadcast is you gave me the opportunity uh, to speak and potentially make a difference in, in the life of maybe one other human being. And that's why I'm on this earth. Well, you made a difference for me, and I'll bet you there are listeners that are going, oh, that, and the, the, I think the key thing is, you know, if, I think a lot of people look for the quick fix. Yeah. If you're yeah. looking for the quick fix, you know, there are some other quick fixes out there. Uh, let, you me know, say, let me say something about a quick fix. Yeah. A quick fix is a quick exit. Yeah. So it might come fast, but it will go fast. Correct. Yeah, yeah. You be in this for the long haul, and the long haul takes time, and and it takes time. But you're not suffering because it's taking time. Because it takes time, you're enjoying the journey, and it's all about the journey. It's not about getting someplace. It's it's not about a destination. Yeah. It's about you know. It's about every day living the journey and and being the best version of yourself. Yes. And that's why we need to take the time. And my, you know, one of the, one of my favorite chapters in Think About Body, Dancing Mind is, is reflection, um, which we could spend another hour just talking about that. But, uh, Oh, listen, I have, <laughs> I have 14 books. We can spend more than an hour. <laughs> yeah, so, that, that's true. One of, one of the things I'd like to do is, uh, if you would, maybe, uh, we just tell the listeners if they want more of what I do, they could go to my website, right? Yes. Wayofchampions.com. Wayofchampions.com. It's uh, it's fun. There are interviews. There are there's there's things to listen to. Uh, scheduling uh, talks about uh, my podcast, Way of Champions. If you'd like to listen to that, uh, and uh, plus all the books and you know you don't even have to buy a book. You can just read it right there on my website. What it's about and how it could help you and uh, and have some fun with it. So yeah, Wayofchampions.com and uh, Send me off an email and let me know how you enjoy it. And I cannot wait to get uh, the competitive Buddha because I, you know, I've got a bit of a library of yours. I, working out, working within was a was a, another one of my favorites. And then coaching with heart. I think if you're a coach, that's uh, yeah. So, well, thank you for the shout out. That's yeah, great. yeah. Uh, so again, Jerry, thank you for being on the show. And uh, as I always tell everybody, uh, keep learning and having fun. Yeah, that's it. It's We're lifelong learners, aren't we? I hope so. Yeah, well, you're doing a good job in helping people to be that way. So um, my hat's off to you. Yeah, well, thanks. Same to you. Thanks. Okay. If you're in charge of your car club's HPDE program, listen up. Ross has a free webinar for you. In it, he shares his insights into what will help you grow attendance and loyalty among participants. The webinar is titled, How to Grow Your High-Performance Driver Education Events. Ross will give you tactical and strategic approaches to making your events more profitable. He tells you how to provide a better learning environment and to create more fun for your participants. And you heard it right. It's free. Ross is making this webinar available at no cost as a way to help you and your organization. He wants to see more people get involved in this sport and he wants to help those already involved continue to enjoy it. You can download this free 1-hour, 15-minute video by going to speedsecrets.com backslash webinars. <laughs>